अवतार मेहर बाबा की जय अवतार मेहर बाबा की जय द सेवन रियलिटीज एग्जिस्टेंस लव सैक्रिफाइस रिनंसिएशन नॉलेज कंट्रोल एंड सरेंडर आई गिव नो इंपॉर्टेंस टू क्रीड डॉगमा कास्ट or the performance of religious ceremonies and rites but to the understanding of the following one the only real existence is that of the one and only god who is the self in every finite self two the only real love is the love for this infinity god which arouses an intense longing to see know and become one with its truth god three the only real sacrifice is that in which in pursuit of this love all things body mind position welfare even life itself are sacrificed four the only real renunciation is that which abandons even in the midst of worldly duties all selfish thoughts and desires five the only real knowledge is the knowledge that god is the inner dweller in good people and in so called bad in saint and so called sinner this knowledge requires you to help all equally as a conscious demand without expectation of reward when compelled to take part in a dispute to act without the slightest trace of enmity or hatred to try to make others happy with brotherly or sisterly feeling for each one and to harm no one in thought word or deed not even those who harm you Six. The only real control is the discipline of the senses to abstain from indulgence in low desires, which alone ensures absolute purity of character. Seven. The only real surrender is that in which poise is undisturbed by any adverse circumstance, and the individual, amidst every kind of hardships, is resigned to the perfect calm, to the will of God. अवतार मेहर बाबा की जय बायोग्राफिकल जर्नी सो we can get started uh, from symbolic excursion uh ashok ji are you in a position to read for some time yeah okay oh, yeah i am one second yeah uh, yeah jay baba jay baba symbolic excursion seldom was the pattern of these days with baba duplicated Though his roots are embedded in that which never changes, the eternal, the foliage of his being in this world of illusion is subject to a constant mutation. He is one who knows that there is no such thing as a good habit, except as it, as it may be a stepping stone to a better one. Our birthdays were always the occasion for a special ce- celebration. and since there were 15 of us in the ashram we had frequent parties the time honored embellishments of ice cream and cake who is also diversified our rhythm the leading motion picture house in nasik owned by some of baba's disciples always provided us with the best seats in the house during this performance as on similar occasions in west in the west baba was deeply engrossed with his inner work i recall one picture in particular because of the point baba made to ask me especially how i like the story the theme concerned a woman who had relinquished great human love for the divine for the master i remember that baba looked smiling he interested when i expressed complete approval of the outcome of the story no doubt because he knew that it dramatized the same principle which was active in my life a progressive relinquishment of the personal 
for the impersonal of the human for the divine. So Some just to take a pause, something like uh, the Heer Ranja and all the famous uh, uh, love stories that Baba quotes even in discourses, right? Wonder which movie this could be. Anyway, continue. Sometimes a picnic or a pilgrimage to a place of spiritual significance would alter our routine. One of these took us to Trembak, the source of Godavari, one of the secret rivers of India, where all are held in reverence by all Hindus. I was still far from robust health, but God said he wished me specially to go. As usual, we left in the cool of the night and arrived at the base of the mountain as the first rays of light for dissolving the darkness. As we emerged from the cars in the hushed expectancy of early dawn, we could hear the chanting of monks in a nearby temple. It was a touch of India of yesterday, of age-old religious observances, and it stuck it struck in as a deep chord of response. But only for a moment were we permitted to revert to the past. Baba signaled us to draw near him. No doubt he felt our pull backward to a phase of consciousness with which he had which he did not wish his disciples to merge. Baba, in so far as he belongs to any one country, by virtue of his spiritual by, by virtue of his physical birth represents the India in the future, of the future. The India whose resected spirit will someday transcend all of death forms and rituals when it exercises its rightful prerogative as spiritual leader among the nations of the world. As we gather around him, as we gather around him, he gave us a few general instructions then told us to begin our climb of the 700 white steps which formed the way of pilgrimage to the river's source. To reach the steps, we had to cross a white field. I started on my way with Malcolm beside me. He, knowing what little energy I had, was much concerned at my attempting such a long climb. I felt, however, that if Baba expected me to climb those steps, to would give me the necessary strength. So we continued on our way. But in a few moments, we heard a call from ba one of Baba's men who was running after us, beckoning us to return. As I approached Baba, he looked at me with this smile and spelled out on his board that he wished me to be carried up the mountain in a basket seat by bearers. I returned his smile and climbed into the seat which hung between two poles. In such a manner, I made my ascent of the sacred mountain. Shrines and temples lined the pathway. The chief one was supervised by Brahmin priests who were greatly excited that Baba was blessing their place of pilgrimage by his presence. Though they had never met him outwardly before, one of their number had prophesied that Baba would be coming soon, and they felt that his visit had deep significance for them and their temple. After viewing the source of the broad river, which appeared as a tiny trickle between rocks, we found a suitable shady location in which to relax. The sun was high now, and the climb had been arduous for the others. They looked forward to a period of rest. Baba but Baba decided that we should eat at once. So the picnic baskets were unpacked, and when the food appeared, we discovered that we were very hungry. Our appetites appeased, we again anticipated a long rest in the cooler mountain air. But within an hour, Baba suggested that we eat again. After the second meal, in which the remainder of the food was consumed, Baba said that since there was nothing more to eat, we could go home. The purpose of leaving, leaving our ashram in the cool of the night had been, Baba said, to avoid 
the heat of the no noon day travel. But now the party had to begin the descent of the mountain just when the sun was at its zenith. Moreover, Baba chose another route down, a shortcut which led through the open country without even the slimmest sapling to suggest the protection which the tree shaded steps had afforded. I wanted to return on my own two legs, but Baba insisted that I go down as I had ascended, carried by the bearers. One episode on this trip revealed to us Baba's benevolent attitude toward suffering. When we reached the top of the mountain, a poor emaciated dog came limping from the bushes toward the group. His face was almost eaten away by disease. The only visible eye looked pathetically as, as he whined miserably. A couple of the younger women cried out hysterically and involuntarily drew back from him. Baba instantly came forward and leaning down, gently placed his hand upon the running sores. The dog sat down on his haunches and turned his face up to Baba, obviously grateful for the healing balm which was being poured upon him. His whine changed into a deep sigh of contentment as the hand of the God-man wiped away the intolerable pain. Turning to the group, Baba admonished, if you can any, do anything, if you can do nothing to help suffering, don't make it worse by indulging your emotions. Here we see the, the compassionate one, the, the compassion of Baba. Amazing. I mean, for a dog who is so sick and has got so many ailments, he just comes up with his compassion. Amazing, amazing. Yes, uh, truly amazing. And it's very well written by Jean. Oh, absolutely. Continue. What does the sentence, last sentence means? If you can do nothing to help, don't make it worse by indulging. So, I, uh, just what happened with that lady, right? The lady that uh, reacted by pulling herself back from the dog and uh, uh, or even e exclaiming uh, hysterically, as uh, Jean says. So, uh, that's, that's a reaction which is insensitive to the pain and does not show empathy. So, Baba saying, even if you're not able to help the situation, at least be uh, considerate and uh, have empathy for the suffering that someone else is going through. That's what I take away from that last line. Yeah, I think empathy is a right emotion. Yeah. What do you say, Sanjay ji? That's correct. That's correct, yeah. Kama is quiet. <laughs> the spiritual implications of this trip are sufficiently apparent to those versed in symbolism to need little elucidation. Baba had used this excursion to typify a phase of our spiritual journey. In the darkness of the night, veiled as yet by the ignorance of the lower mind, we had travelled to the source of the sacred river, the river of life. Having arrived at our destination, the bread of life, spiritual sustenance was given to us by the master. The descending shortcut suggests a quicker return to normal consciousness and functioning after the super conscious state of God realization, which arriving at the source and receiving food supplies. We food descended. Implied. Sorry? Food implies. Ah, food implies. Okay, yes. Sorry. We decided again to the valley of illusion to fulfill our destiny as servants of the master. Perhaps the process which Baba had initiated at the Pondulena caves some months before was now consummated. That I should have made the ascent and descent of the mountains carried by bearers other than under my own momentum suggests my need for a special technique which the master's grace supplied. 
again a beautiful beautiful thing that they you call observe it, they call it pandav leni in okay. uh, astrik they call it pandav leni and mm-hmm. actually that's the place where pandavas are supposed to have stayed and oh. there are seen caves and uh, last time that i said that we had gone to nasik and i shared some pictures so during that trip we had also gone to this place those old pictures are there uh, how do you pronounce it pandav leni pandav leni pandav leni leni pandav leni leni okay it's quite a steep uh, uh, climb climb yeah. okay uh, motorable or uh, uh, no no no, no. you have to you have to now if they may i have made it but that time it was uh, no you just Steps. go yeah yeah okay okay so the point i was going to make just as we finish this paragraph is so uh, a beauty of an author is how you not only convey using language what is happening but also constantly change roles right so she does this beautifully right just in the last paragraph she zooms out so she's giving detailed account this happened we ate we ate again we walked down so it's a uh, a detailed level if you look at it in today's terms you zoom in to something then she quickly zooms out and says maybe this is what happened what happened is this uh, 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 this was symbolic of what baba is trying to convey yeah, yeah. do with the souls right so I like this style of yeah, yeah. Uh, right, right, right. constantly That's does correct. this. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Though the story this. is on, the message doesn't get uh, hidden under the story. Message yes. keeps coming. <laughs> and and she's very explicit about it and 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 uh, repetitive about it, right? So it, the, it follows a pattern. It follows a follows a pattern of bringing out bringing that message out all the time. Very nice. Yes. Yeah. Story is only a thread, actually. Correct. On which. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kartik i just thought we can can we, can we go up again back to the paragraph mhm uh, you know this the descending shortcut suggests a quicker return to normal consciousness and functioning after the super conscious state of god realization which arriving at the source and receiving food implies i, I think we can highlight this or underline this No, actually, I was tempted to underline the whole thing. Thank you for. Okay, oh, oh, oh. the whole thing you can do that. Yeah, from here to right. You can even include this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Monster mystery. Early in February. Baba had predicted that April would inaugurate a period of merging more deeply with the divine life, and most happily, this was true for some of us. I felt so closely attuned to Baba's spirit that I saw and felt him in everything. Naturally, this heightened perception brought about with it deep peace and joy. I felt as though I were reliving the early days of his first visit to America. Throughout May, his awareness continued. But this this awareness continued. Then, with the coming of the monsoon, Baba cancelled his weekly visits to our ashram, and coincident with the withdrawal of his physical presence, it seemed to me as though he withdrew an inner contact as well. The deep transference which he had induced and fostered was now to be resolved. But I did not then perceive this. all i knew was then that a screen of darkness seemed to shut me off from in inner contact with him this strange gloom found its outer counterpart in the leaden skies which now overshadowed us for weeks the indian monsoon was truly a, a disquieting effect on one the tremendous tension which the physical body has been sustained during during the intense tropic heat is now released human beings animals and the very earth are almost is terribly grateful for the refreshing downpour a torrent which seems likely never to cease at first
Hello. Yeah, yeah. Please, please continue at first. Yeah. No, no. Hi, I, just one sec. Some, something. Um, at first, one does not care whether the sun ever shines again or not. The relief from the torrid heat, heat is so well welcome. But as the days pass into weeks, the constant deluge, the heavy skies weigh upon one's spirit. With the torrential rain seems to come a descent of tremendous forces, both positive and negative, which serve to annihil annihilate the past, even as the sheets of rain seem to wash away all traces of yesterday's promise. A feeling of insulation from the rest of life pervaded me, and I found it increasingly difficult to respond to even the kindest overture on the part of my comrades. From the beginning of June until we left for Europe at the end of July, we saw Baba only twice. Perhaps he was preparing us for the much longer separation which was later to follow. Just prior to his absenting himself from our retreat, a major crisis developed which involved the entire group and Baba and gave Baba the cue to break up the Nasik Ashram. For a day or two, he discussed with us possible alternatives of location. He suggested certain sections of India where the climate would be more salubrious and other in southern France or Italy. Many of the group wanted to return to Portofino on the Ligurian coast of Italy, where they had spent such happy hours with Baba. But without opposing their suggestion, he led the decision towards Cannes on the French Riviera. Why he chose this particular spot, he never revealed, but a variety of possibilities suggest themselves. His strategic location in the war pattern shortly to unfold may have been a driving factor in his, in his decision. Or perhaps he wished to touch the soil which is so pregnant with legends of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Joseph of Arimathea, and others of the disciples. Or maybe it was to keep a psychic appointment with one who was later destined to become, can you just raise it please, a wholehearted devotee of the master. So I think uh, uh, Kama has been to Portofino, right? Uh, Portofino and uh, I, I, I don't know about Cannes. Maybe he's traveled to Cannes as well. But I think he did Portofino last year around this time. Mm -hmm. But um, I have one comment that uh, is contrary to what she thinks about the rains. And this is personal. If you if you look at rains, I, I she she links rains to some some negative aspects or at least uh, uh, aspects of concern which i don't seem to share right so at least from an indian context rains are just about being uh, about positive about uh, uh, the, the symbolism is always laden with uh, the positive aspects of life it's uh, it's not just a relief from the heat but also the promise of the future it's the uh, it's uh, um abundance it's it's basically all the good stuff other than when it becomes something like a flood right so yes. that's yeah. that's uh, i think it's it's, uh, it's uh, her personal thing exactly her personal it's too much of land you, know, you, just, you just get confined and it's raining and yes. raining and raining. yes and all that it's, it's just that feeling even i get that when it is like a week it is continuously raining no it, there's no and this is the period in Maharashtra, especially in Bombay and uh, Nasik and Thane. Yeah, that is, there's a deluge. There's no rain if the deluge. Actually. Absolutely. Tell it's me about it. Maybe, maybe that yet it, it must have been heavier. So that it also changes year by year. Correct. So that's her uh, experience she's just sharing. Yeah. Uh, and also the greatest spiritual aspect is that whenever it rains, Baba has said that it is my, I am a, my presence is there. Is there. Oh, hey, Ashokji, but if it rains too much, that probably is too much present or what? <laughs> Sorry? 26-11, he was too much present here. 26 July. <laughs> yes. 
so it's, it's just that it's just uh, just a normal comment of a observer you know how, how does yeah, yeah, yeah. it nothing to do with or, spirituality or, here just a comment correct or 10 days back in dubai yeah it's like that <laughs> <laughs> it's just a feelings yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, Master. we can uh, rotate the reading as well. So, if if you are comfortable, you can read for some more time, or I can take over for some time, or Sanjay ji can take over. Ashok, you want ah, to? Yeah, can't take you read. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll continue. Master Angler, though much of his activity in the West, Baba directed toward motion pictures. the results were inconclusive until at length he came in contact with a particular man alexander marky was drawn into baba's orbit by some of our new york friends who had charge of the motion picture phase of his work he was prevailed upon as many others had been in the preceding years to write a motion picture treatment incorporating certain fundamental spiritual themes which baba had outlined many other treatments had been sub- submitted to baba only to receive his courteous thank you and the request to his new york group to find another writer when this m- new man's name was cabled to baba prior to his beginning the script baba cabled his reply marky is the man when the finished treatment was sent to the master he cabled back that it was accepted and from that day baba ceased his search for other motion picture writers it was not until months later that alexander marky met the master in london at the time the western group was on its way to india he considers that meeting as the great turning point in his life after a lifetime of spiritual groping and searching mostly in the dark he says he had the rare privilege of being drawn into the orbit of this very great soul the living incarnation of what man has always conceived as his ultimate noblest self meher baba the master's work and personality had made a profound impression on marky long before he met him but intellectually he found it impossible to gauge the nature of this impression or the reason for it his mind kept rejecting its influence yet in the midst of a very active life a vague insistent premonition of something extraordinary about to happen persisted in dogging him then a series of mysterious even startling events came into his life at the time they seemed wholly unrelated often without apparent meaning at times incredible incidents too many to relate culminated in a call out of the blue inviting him to london to supervise the production of a motion picture at the time he was so involved in long range activities in the united states that it seemed absolutely impossible for him to accept the offer much as he felt inclined to do so but overnight everything changed as if by magic and within a few days he found himself on the queen mary bound for the british isles in england he was confronted with an entirely new unexpected set of events which seemed to have nothing to do with his summons to london the source of which vanished into the blue whence the call had come to his reasoning mind these baffling developments made no sense until the momentous day when he received a message that meher baba had arrived in london from india and wished to see him as a journalist and editor he had occasion to interview some of the world's outstanding most spectacular figures nor had he nor had he ever had any difficulty in taking them all in his stride crowned heads the great in the world of letters and the arts dictators had been just so much grist to his editorial mill but 
when he stood at the door beyond which Meher Baba was waiting for him, he felt like a bewildered little child. For the first time in his memory, he admits he was wholly at a loss to know how to behave, what to do, what to say. It was an astonishing sensation and he was utterly confounded. Then the door opened and he found himself in the presence of the most sublime embodiment of purity in human form I had ever beheld. Before he realized it and without conscious volition on his part, he and Baba were in each other's embrace like two long lost brothers who had at last found each other again after eons of anguished search. And in that supreme moment, all Marquis doubts, all intellectual questioning, all bewilderment dissolved like snow at the loving touch of the sun. As if a magic touch had adjusted the focal lens of his vision, he saw things in a light that had never seen, that he had never before been his. I repeat the line, as if a mag magic touch had adjusted the focal lens of his vision, he saw things in a light that had never been before, had never before been his. Sorry. He knew within himself that this moment was the real reason for his being in London and that the whole bizarre kaleidoscope of events which had preceded it had been wondrously prearranged for this one purpose by the unspoken command of the silent master. In a flash, he saw vividly the beauty and perfection of the whole pattern which now culminated in this supreme meeting of his career. He felt for the first time the full surge of that divine solvent of which we hear so much and speak so often, but which few experience. The love that transcends human limitations, the love that embraces the world. Nor is he the least reluctant to admit that he found himself weeping for the sheer inexpressible joy of it. Between the time he stepped into Baba's room and the time he left it, a new world had been born for him. So overwhelming was the experience that in boundless ecstasy, he walked the streets of London all night, completely oblivious of time, space, and such archaic habits as sleep. Since that incomparable event, he confirms, life had taken on an entirely new meaning and momentum for him. Some months after my return to America, I met Xander, as Marky is known to his intimates, and he told me of a further arresting chapter in his experience with the master. While we were on our way from India to Cannes a year later, Xander, who was then in Paris, had a strong urge to start work on a particular play which he had long been mulling around in his mind. The ideal setting for the writing of it, he decided, was of all places in the world, a certain hotel in Cannes, which overlooked the Mediterranean. He had not been in touch with Baba or any of our group since that momentous meeting in London, so had no way of knowing of Baba's plans. Backing up, he went to Cannes, wondering why he had chosen it. On arrival there, he found a radiogram awaiting him. It had been forwarded from London by way of Paris and was from Baba, somewhere in the Indian Ocean, asking Z Xander if he could arrange to go to Cannes, as Baba would be visiting there for some months and would like him to be near him. Suddenly, Xander knew why he had been drawn to that particular spot at the precise moment in time. Such is an example of Baba's drawing power with those who are deeply in tune with him and may possibly have been one of the reasons why Baba chose Khans as his headquarters in Europe at that time. Wow. Okay, that brings 
the close of uh, chapter six. So uh, Khan's episode is, I think, not covered in detail. Now we talk about, or maybe this is the beginning of that. Yeah, chapter seven to Europe with Baba. My departure from India st stirred in me the opposing emotions of sadness and relief as I recalled the poignant moments associated with my life there. I was still smarting under the drastic discipline of being compelled to face the dark side of my nature alone, unaided by any apparent help from my master. I sensed that a phase of this discipline was about to terminate, and for this, I felt a genuine sense of relief, even though it meant leaving India. I sensed also as I drove away from the Nasik Ashram that it would be many years before I would return there. Regret and joy danced together in my heart in a strange counterpointal rhythm. The part of me, which was still unredeemed, delighted to be leaving the sense of so much pain. The better part of me wept that a phase of my life with Baba was over. I felt that after our European visit, I would not be separated from him for some time. Mercifully, the master wailed me, wailed from me the knowledge that it could run into many years. Our voyage through the intense August heat of the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea was a trying experience for everyone, but especially for the group of secluded women from the Holy Hill at Mehrabad. Baba wished this seclusion to continue in symbolic form even on this long voyage. To ensure this, some wore dark glasses taped at the sides to shut out as much as possible, the distracting sights of the mundane world. Others used the hoods of their capes to cover their heads and eyes when passing people. Due to this enforced blindness, they were led at each stage of the journey by some of the Western women symbolizing the role that she, the awakened woman, must play in leading her blind sisters to the realization of their true destiny. This is not, of course, to suggest that these particular Eastern women were spiritually unawake, but merely that they were being used by Baba as symbols of the inner redemptive work which he was effecting through them for womankind everywhere. This blindfolded journey also illustrates the childlike faith which surrenders utterly to the will of the master, asking nothing but to be led by him. On board, they kept strictly to their cabins, except during the early hours prior to dawn, when by special arrangement with the purser, they were permitted to walk with Baba and the Western women on an upper first class deck which was free from the intrusion of other passengers. Baba appointed two of the Western women to watch over the Eastern sisters, to safeguard their cabins from outsiders, and to attend to their bodily needs. During the rough part of the voyage, this necessitated their acting as combination nurse and cham chambermaid. One night, when Baba foresaw possible embarrassment to the Eastern women, he asked Norina to sleep on the floor outside the door of the women's cabin, which had to remain open to give better ventilation. She was suddenly startled out of sleep by the form of a man stumbling over her as he tried to enter the women's cabin. Having stayed too long at the bar, he was reeling his way back to his cabin and in his confused state of mind, got into the wrong passageway. Thus did Baba's prevision and a Western man's devotion prevent an unhappy experience for the little nuns? Wonderful. Via Crucis. As our ship flowed through the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea, I was compelled to see to face the full impact of the negative images in the unconscious, which of course the sea typifies. The reverse current which Baba had instituted in India at the time of his withdrawal from our retreat became more and more intense. 
Even before boarding the ship, my inner darkness seemed to shut me off from all contact with Baba or the group. I, who had been so close to the master's heart, now felt like an utter stranger. On board, outer circumstances confirmed this feeling of estrangement. The cabin which had been assigned to us was in the hold of the ship with no possibility of any ventilation. The portholes were sealed because they fell below the waterline. Just a few yards from our cabin door was the hold in which sheepskins shipped from Australia were odorously drying. Just one visit to the cabin was sufficient to convince, convince us that sleeping there was out of the question. Malcolm was considerably disturbed chiefly for my sake because of my physical condition, which was far from normal. When Baba was told about the accommodations, he made various such suggestions, one of which was that I take a first class cabin since there were no other cabins available in second and he would see that the difference in price was paid for it. Naturally, I refused this offer. When he, the master, was traveling second, I had no desire to travel first. He sent word back to me that he wished me to accept a first-class cabin, but again, I refused. I sent the message back that I could not obey such an order. Later, Word was brought to me that he was very happy, happy about my decision. When I saw him some days later, I laughingly suggested that there were apparently circumstances when one would be compelled to disobey his outer order if it conflicted with one's inner guidance. He agreed that this had been one of those rare occasions. It was finally arranged that we remove the mattresses from our bunks and sleep on deck. And I was given permission to use the first class washrooms and toilet, which saved trips up and down stairs. Being very ill and weak, this new arrangement was a great boon. Twice a day, Malcolm would descend for a few brief moments to our cabin to bring up our mattresses and night clothes and to return them in the morning. As the trip through the Indian Ocean progressed, I became more ill in body and more desperate in mind. Baba, who was constantly watching over the other, I saw just twice, once in the beginning of the trip and once when I asked permission to see him regarding the terrible hatred I was experiencing for everyone and everything. I recall that he asked if I knew why had I had such feelings. My answer that I must be a very wicked person was not highly discriminating as his shake of the head indicated. Now, of course, I recognize that I was being brought face to face with the inner darkness which is resident in every human being. But at that time, I was unaware of this psychological necessity. Consequently, I unconsciously projected this shadow upon everyone and everything outside of myself in the form of negative emotions of hatred, resentment, bitterness and self-pity. In such a state of mind, I naturally felt completely cut off from any contact with reality. I was imprisoned in a dark, enclosed universe and a, and a very minute one at that. All that might have com comforted or sustained me was non-existent. Even hope had vanished. Though my physical eyes were open, they saw nothing but dead form. My ears heard only the moaning of my own heart. Again, I tried to surrender more deeply, but now there was nothing, no one to whom I could surrender. I was at length compelled to accept this living death, but I did so not with the high valor which the saints have displayed in their dark hours, but with the pitiful acceptance of one whose soul is still resistant to the master's touch. I am now aware that behind this resistance was the unconscious fear for my body. 
Much as I tried, I could not let go of body consciousness, which this trip and much of my painful experience in India was bringing into the foreground to be faced and transcended. Such facing and transcendence being essential on the path of discipleship, because so long as there is fear for the body, there can be no realization for the soul. Beautiful. Two things were taking place during this via crucis. All secondary centers of consciousness, even those which one would normally consider good and legitimate, were being shut off as karmic forces converged upon the soul's citadel. At the same time, Baba was unloosening the personal fetters which bound me to him, the youthful period of discipleship being at an end. He was preparing me for the more mature role which would involve for me greater depth of insight and full-hearted acceptance of responsibility and lead eventually to the merging of my consciousness with his universal self. These are really two aspects of one process, an essential one for the soul which seeks union with its God self. But only subsequent soul searching brought to me this understanding. The best I could do, and a very poor best, I must admit, was to bear this period of trial with as much fortitude as I could muster. So skillful a divine psychologist is Baba that even in one's Calvary, he leaves little room for glorifying in one's tribulations. That one comes through such an experience, unmaimed in mind and spirit, is more through the grace of the Master, even though unfelt at the time, than through any heroic efforts of one's own. Wow. What is Calvary? Mm -hmm. Enthusiasm? Does it mean like that? Something but, like that. I think it is in capitals. Yeah, so it's a place, a hill outside uh, Jerusalem on which Jesus was sculpture or picture representing experience of extreme suffering. Okay, so extreme suffering, he leaves little room for glorifying in one's tribulation. So it's a biblical reference to suffering. There was another word I wanted to look up, which was uh, via crucis. Where is Via Crucis? Yeah, here it is. Another term for the way of the cross. Okay, cruis, crucis. A lengthy and distressing or painful procedure. We embarked on a Via Crucis of tired comic formulae, whatever. So it's a Latin word. <clears throat> okay. That which in psychological terminology we call the abyss is the same condition which the mystic terms the dark night of the soul. Both terms graphically depict the mental state through which everyone apparently must pass in making the transition from a self-centered life to a God-filled one. So if you remember, I, I, I mean, at least I'm talking about myself, the first reference to uh, Dark Knight of the Soul was in uh, uh, um, uh, the, the book Stay With God. So uh, um, Francis Brabazon talks about this. This is again a biblical concept, but then it's about intense uh, mental state. Uh, and it's it's a story with which is a tragedy and, and so on and so forth. So I, I don't know much about it, but. It's used a lot in Western cosmology and Western uh, biblical studies and spirituality. Kama, any comments on this? He's now there on the call. Yeah, yeah. Night. I think we also referred fourth plane and fifth plane transition. Was that also a reference? Is it? Okay. I'm not sure of that. I don't recollect. Sure. What is, what is 
what is the question dark night of the soul what does the concept mean in christianity i think the same thing dark night of the soul is when you are in spiritual desperateness you know when you want to when you are in the spiritual path um you go through these dark uh, times where you are not sure whether you are uh, actually um on the right path are you doing the right thing uh, the question will come is there really a god uh, do i need to worship him you know so so on and so forth so the dark night of the soul you know i think if you google it probably you'll get better explanations but uh, also i think that uh, the fourth plane where we have infinite energy infinite power that is also a form of a dark night of the soul uh, where maya is uh, maximum and tries to influence you to use your infinite power to do uh, non spiritual things so the dark night of the soul is uh, depending on each person's uh degree of consciousness or which plane he's in whether he's in the gross plane still going through reincarnation or even going through the different planes uh you know till the sixth plane uh probably till the fourth plane i can say because in the fifth and sixth plane you are kind of safe uh so up till the fourth plane uh, different individuals can go through different experiences um uh, um you know like that uh, pink floyd album the dark side of the moon which is the apogee and perigee side so that is uh, that is one way of interpreting it jay baba okay so there's quite a bit available online about dark night of the soul and uh, let's further filter it to see if we find something yeah okay this is the original saint john of the cross um, okay what does meher baba say on this just okay this is a meher baba quote so let's try to read it dark night of the soul meher baba just as anything may happen to a man traveling over an unknown pitch black at the night so anything may happen to one who must pass through the fourth plane without the guiding hand of a perfect master that is why for all its dazzling splendor and power the period of going through the fourth plane is termed in christian mysticism the dark night of the soul brilliant sanjay ji if the advanced pilgrim is at all able to resist the allurements and treacheries of the dark night of the soul he enters enters the mental sphere manobhumika or the alam e jabrut by the fifth and final double seven in one achievement which occurs on the same lines as the fourth all the folds of the veil are removed together with the relative knots desires colors and impressions the sixth and seventh doors as represented by the right and the left eyes are crossed and the fifth plane of light and love is reached beautiful so we got a good explanation i believe so let's continue i, uh, I did a chat gpt it says dark night of the soul refers to a spiritual concept often associated with intense periods of inner turmoil doubt and existential crisis it's a time of profound personal transformation and growth although it can be incredibly challenging to navigate so that's a short definition jay baba sure chat gpt it is so by the way word of warning be very careful using chat gpt in the sense that it's i mean it's prone to error like everything else right garbage in garbage out so if you're doing something materially very important um like drafting something and so on use abundant caution and even in research because 
um, the way it works now is it's it's not even sure depending on the service you use. You don't know what is the data set that it uses to make its answers, right? So use it with a pinch of uh, what should I say? Use it with a lot of caution and care. But yeah, in this case, it uh, gave us only the Christian answer, which, which was right, which we saw already. But I think I'm glad we found a, a Baba quote uh, connected to that. Okay. And also on Wikipedia, on Wikipedia, there is a dark night of the soul. Uh, it is a poem also by the poet St. John of the Cross, a 16th yeah. century Spanish mystic. Here it is. So you can also have a look at it. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. I saw that. Toledo. So that, I think that's where the name um, came, right? So, or maybe the name, uh, it's the most popular references in, from the poem. And then there's commentaries on it and so on. Yeah. So interesting. OK, let's get back to our reading. Yeah, so let me continue. In the spiral way, John Cordelier writes, the love of God is never idle, for it constrains us to follow the way of the cross, pressing in on us, transfusing us, thrusting life forward on its long quest of perfection that stern and tender love compels its children to the only journey which leads home. It blocks all other paths to force us to a path of unutterable harshness that leads us, it seems, to the place of death. Yet shall lead us, if we trust it, to the only country of the soul. He desires to consume our very life in order that he may change it into his own. I repeat the beautiful line. He desires to consume our very life in order that he may change it into his own. He, he and his are H capital. When he has utterly devoured us, then it is that he gives himself to us. Beautiful lines from a book that she's quoting, obviously biblical or Gnosis related uh, book, but very nice. Yeah, that's exactly I was thinking of highlighting this book. Thanks. Yeah. I now had embarked on that phase of the crisis initiated in India, in which I felt utterly out of from Baba. From God. And since this unrolling of the film in reverse was now in the slowest of slow motion, it was to be many months before the Robin song across the meadow would awaken my soul to the peace of God again. So much there was, apparently, that I needed to assimilate so much of the little self to be eliminated. Yet, now in retrospect, the pain, full memory of this voyage is mingled with a haunting, ineffable joy which I'm sure must have been there all the time, had my channels been clear enough to sense it. I can now apprehend the truth of Baba's words. For one who has no self-interest, even hell is heaven. For one who has no self-interest, even hell is heaven. What do you make of this sentence? Self-interest, is it... Uh, yeah, he doesn't get bothered, right? He doesn't get bothered because he doesn't have any self-interest. Any any hell means any any bad situation also he's he's equally happy. Where he is so in this sense, he is already in the state of selfless behavior or selfness in all behavior. Is that what is being referred? I personally, yeah, it's basically, it's basically that if you are not selfish and you're honest to yourself and uh, basically you're non-dual, 
you know nothing uh, as baba says whether pleasure or pain happens or somebody applauds you and you feel good and somebody criticizes you and you feel bad in both circumstances you don't you experience equipoise under all circumstances uh, that is a form of no self interest so heaven and hell are basically states of mind as we know depending on the emotion so hell is a negative emotion and heaven is a positive emotion so this is basically within the domain of duality so if you transcend that as you said selfishness selflessness to selfness so that is how you can interpret that jay baba jay baba okay let's continue um when before leaving india we expressed to an eastern disciple the wish that he were going with us to europe he smiled and shook his head i have traveled with baba and it's never a picnic if the vicissitudes attendant upon traveling with baba occurred only occasionally one might ascribe them to coincidence but when over the years they occur without fail whenever baba travels one is induced to look for a less circumstantial reason whenever the master journeys negative as well as positive forces are called into action whenever the master journey i'm i'm repeating that line whenever the master journeys negative as well as positive forces are called into action that one is often more aware of the negative or shadow side is due to the fact that our egoistic selves are too much concerned with the elements of discomfort and dislike to discern the light which i now realize is also present at such times some weeks after we settled at kans one of baba's men who had been on the boat with us told me that every morning around 3 3 or 4 o'clock baba took them to the upper deck where i was sleeping and stood quietly watching over me for a few minutes so i was not as utterly deserted as i had thought myself to be very interesting i like this line just for yeah for the journey's part so baba obviously the the journeys that he did were very very special we saw it in wayfarers we saw it uh, in in other books right so the the obviously is doing intense amount of work and a it's symbolic and uh, b it's also uh, deeply transformational for the protagonists in that travel right they they experience changes and we are seeing this in jean's case uh, personally uh, in detail but i think it, this there's tremendous importance and uh, significance that uh, baba had in travel right anyway that's me my comment let's continue uh, we can again rotate the reading if somebody wants to read the till the end of the session uh, sanjay are you in a position ashish yeah, yeah, yeah. i'll i'll take 10 seconds then yeah. yeah yeah sure i just thought it was a new section so it's a good time Yeah, my hand. Okay. Yeah. The film unfolds. When we arrived at the villa in Cannes, which one of the English group had acquired prior to our coming, Baba found it inadequate for his Indian women, whose seclusion had to be maintained. Within a day or two. another house was leased a few miles away and here the eastern eastern women lived with a few of their western sisters baba spent most of his time there coming down to our house only for interviews in the morning and for the bathing and feeding of mamod the i think this is mohammed must the chief must yeah. who at baba's order had been bought to europe shortly after our arrival by some of the indian men after the various movings from one room to another which have been earlier described 
Malcolm and I settled down in a very large room in the main house with a beautiful view of the Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean seen through large waving palm trees in our front garden. Physically, the surroundings were ideal. The climate was most beneficial for those of us who had suffered from the tropical heat of India. Renewed physical life began to stare in me, but how little this counted when my heart and mind were so ill at ease. With me, Baba was continuing his inner withdrawal as well as the outer. I saw little of him, and when I did, he assumed a remote and casual role for the most part. Added to this trial was the increasing tension between Malcolm and me, which the crisis in India seemed to have brought to a head. He was now under the disciple discipline imposed by Baba of being confined to our room, eating but one meal a day and maintaining complete silence. Difficult as this, no doubt, was for him. He derived some real joy from it as it gave his naturally reflective temperament opportunity for deeper introversion. If a human relationship is too possessive, too dependent, one upon the other, it will constitute a serious obstruction to the free flow of divine life and must therefore be resolved and reform. It was this process which Baba had initiated. Furious images from the unconscious were released, and even though Malcolm was pledged not to speak, and he obeyed this order faithfully, I became the recipient of all the dark and repressed emotions which were being steered in him. No doubt, to him, I seemed to be the provoker of his moods, just as he seemed to me to be the occasioner of much mental anguish. Less and less was I the indulgent mother who catered to his moods. More and more was he the antithesis of the comforting father who would fortify me in my weaknesses. If he seemed to fail me, certainly I must also have failed him. Since in both of us, there was so much unconscious longing and adolescent craving which we were trying to fulfill to each other. It was inevitable that Baba should stir up these hidden forces and bring them into the light of consciousness for us to face and assimilate the power resident in them. But during those days at Keynes, I was too close to the problem, both physically and emotionally, to have much understanding of it, to escape from the tempestuous atmosphere of our room. I took to spending the day up in the hills, fortified with a few raw carrots and a piece of cheese. A sketch pad and crayons, I would set forth in the morning into the mountains which overlooked, overlooked the town and the ever enchanting sea to let off some of the pressure which I was experiencing. I would dance and sing with complete abandon when I found myself far enough away from houses and people. This proved to be a providential safety valve. Because during this period, I came as close to the borderline of mental disintegration as one could go and yet retain some degree of balance. Baba was, of course, watching and guiding behind the scenes as I realized even then, but see much more clearly now. 
One night, just before dinner, I had reached such a zenith of desperation that I left the house and again climbed into the mountains. Some of our family had encountered enormous snakes, which we had been told were poisonous, on their tramps through the wooded section. So into this part, I hiked, hoping, praying, that an obliging snake would relieve me from any further responsibility to this life. As it became very dark and I became weary from climbing, I sat down in the woods and prayed with the thought of how sweet death would taste if it should suddenly come upon me there in the cool dark of night. Seize upon the midnight without pain or even with it, seemed a most desirable fancy that might, that night. After about two hours of this eerie whistle, I was compelled by some inner force to pick myself up and walk back to the house. With no sense of jubilation, but the realization that a low water mark had been passed, a new surrender plumped. I trudged homeward, Homeward. Life must be lived, not covertly rejected. In spite of the anguish of soul, in spite of everything, I must go resolutely forward. With this conviction, I found my way home. As I approached our property, I heard the voices of searching parties who was scouring the neighborhood for me. Humiliated and ashamed, I sunk in through a back lane without encountering any of the group. Stopping at the kitchen, I made apologies to our housekeeper for being absent from dinner. The next morning, when I saw Baba, he never showed by even the flicker of an eyelash that he knew of my Capad. But I was aware that he had been with me every moment in consciousness and knew even better than I the motivating causes of my reckless behavior. The afternoon, when I saw him again, as I knelt beside his coach, he took my head between his hands and poured upon it such healing balm that most of the anguish dissolved. Again, I had proved my himself the master of consciousness who takes one to the breaking point, but not one hair's breadth beyond that which the mind can with safety endure. Kartik. Kartik? Yeah, let's go. Yeah, full paragraph. During this period, he said to me once, You think I'm cruel? Feeling rebellious, I exclaimed, You are cruel. I must be temporarily cruel. He replied, In order to be permanently kind. Then looking at me compassionately for a few moments, he added, the day will come when even the memory of this pain will be completely obliterated by the all-consuming joy which will flow, flood your mind. When I remonstrated that the night was so long, he assured me that when daylight came, everything I had borne would be seen to have been a thousand times worthwhile. Illustrating another aspect of this healing with souls, he said to me, towards the end of the European visit, I push you away and I draw you close again. I push you off and draw you even closer. Now I push you far away. And the next time I draw you back to me, it will remain with, it will be 
it will be to remain one with my universal self forever. This is a beautiful simile, if you want to say, it, you know, very, very nice. I remember reading it long back. Yeah, beautiful. So this is what we feel all our lives. Yeah. And we must know that the final pull will come someday. Yeah. The period of darkness, which I have related was, of course, the pushing off part of the process, painful in the extreme. But how necessary and beneficial I now comprehend it to have been. Though it was generated in me greater intensity of soul desire for union with God. Soul, soul desire. <laughs> Effort our meeting. One of the strangest and probably most significant episodes of the European visit was the trip which Baba made to Paris, accompanied by a few of his Western women, devotees, and all of the secluded Indian women. On this journey, made by motor, in cars driven by two of the Western women, same strict regulations were observed to assure the privacy of the Eastern women. When they arrived in Paris, they were received by Consuelo Seitz, a devotee of Baba, whose charming house faces the left bank of the scene. Probably never in the whole history of Paris or any of the city in the world, for that matter, had such a strange sightseeing party graced its precedence. During the three-day visit, Baba and the group rode up and down the scene, drove around the city and the neighboring localities, with the Eastern women looking up or out only when instructed by Baba. The main feature of their sightless sightseeing was a trip to the Eiffel Tower, one night during which Baba held one of his most important inner meetings with saints and masters of the sixth and seventh planes of consciousness. In my supposition, if my supposition is correct, that the consciousness of womankind is being raised by special work, which Baba is doing through these Indian women, then the women of then the women of Paris who by reputation have particular need of a more spiritualized concept of life, must have been subjected to a strangely unfamiliar rate of vibration that night. Fantastic as this supposition may seem, it would appear to have been somewhat sustained, substantiated by the amazing action of the new post-war government in France, which had outlawed, outlawed prostitution and bowdiness, as it has also granted to the French women, for the first time in history of France, equal rights with men. Both actions indicating radical changes in the French attitude towards women. Baba and his party arrived back at Keynes in the evening and the next morning he came to our room. When he entered, I saw at once that he was almost wholly in a super consciousness state, super conscious state. So I ran to take the, his arm and lead him to the couch. I sat down beside him, which Malcolm, while Malcolm stood before us. Baba looked first at one, then on the other with. With the expression of a little child who is dazed by some unearthly beauty which no words can describe. 
important is it baba dear i asked looking at me as i should know he spelled out haven't you heard about the meeting his eyes were so eloquent and anguish joy with anguish joy that i could inwardly hear the plaintive tone in his unspoken words this was one of his beautiful childlike moments no dear i answered i hadn't heard then he told us that a most important meeting had been held in the eiffel tower and that even since had been difficult to hold himself in his physical body he rested his head on my shoulder for a few moments as he gathered his forces together to go on to the next phase of his daily work which never ceases finally at this signal we helped him to the door where a couple of his devotees indian men were waiting to assist him when i saw him an hour later the painful transition had been accomplished it was his usual dynamic self playing again his cosmic game to the forces of the universe so this period is be- between the first and the second world war and paris was quite destroyed in fact the whole of europe was quite badly damaged so the war started this is, in 1940 uh, yeah 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 39 39 to 45 yeah so it is just before that yeah 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 no but uh, interesting and uh, uh, interesting to note that the eiffel tower was a uh, venue for one of these meetings and yeah, this yeah. so shows such a beautiful aspect of baba's life the way he uh, in his form of having come down he experiences uh, you know the limitations as well as the unlimited self in in the same way right so it's a very nice uh, few paragraphs that we read good really touching yeah been to eiffel tower but <laughs> probably that time i had not read the book uh, okay not recall feeling could have mm. been different mm. first time i went for indeed okay and also the, the river scene and there is a walkway around the river scene can also mm. port mm. again underlying the dying need for baba who app <laughs> <Get that. laughs> okay please continue hey, baba babel of tongues during our visit to It's called Cans, is it or Cans? Cans, yeah, it's Cans, Cans, yeah. yeah. I don't know what. During our visit to Cans, people from all countries of Europe came to see Baba. Frequently at lunch or tea, a veritable cross section of the League of Nations was seated. Okay, so it's like like a League of Nations was seated around our long table. French, Italian, German, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, Swiss. Cambodian, Scandinavian, different Indian dialects, and of course English, beat with each other for a vocal supremacy. But after a different mission, our people had. But what a different mission people these people had. Most of them shared with the rest of the conviction, rest of us the conviction that only through a change. of the consciousness of mankind with the ideals of universal brotherhood which underlined the original concept of the league came into being these men and women many of them diplomats statesmen leaders in their particular fields of art science and religion came humbly to sit in the presence of one whom they believed held the key to the world's problems the divine solvent of selfless love in talking with them after their meeting was the master one could see in their eyes 
that Baba's life giving leave in was already quickening in their souls a pure, purer love and altruistic ambition to become better instruments to the power of God to work through. One of these visitors was Alexander Matthew, who came daily to sit at Baba's feet as he outlined for the master's program of spiritual, inspirational, and educational motion pictures, which Baba said will someday form the basis of our entirely new trend in motion pictures. So these Baijus was founded there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So just uh, as context, right, uh, I'm sure you many of you know of this. The League of Nations was the precursor to United Nations, right? right. So it was, yeah, it was created as, a, uh, and then it got dissolved after uh, World War II and then United, uh, uh, United Nations got formed. Of course, sadly, neither of those institutions are doing what they are supposed to do. And that's, again, a uh, sad commentary on the state of the world. But hey, what do we do? It's so not for us we... to judge. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, League of Nations, United Nations uh, is all showing the extreme forms of ego. But can you just look up mm. the word Levin? L-E-A-V-E-N. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah, let's look it up. I don't know if it is a typo or as a substance. Okay. This is a pervasive influence, probably this meaning a pervasive influence that modifies something or transforms it for the better. They acted as an intellectual leaven to the warriors who dominated the city. So let's see that again. Uh, in talking with them, after their meeting with the master, one could see in their eyes that Baba's life-giving leaven was already quickening in their souls. Yeah, his life-giving persuasion was already quickening in their souls, a purer love, an altruistic ambition to become better instruments for the power of God to work through. I think that's the second meaning. Okay. So I think uh, we'll stop given that uh, you're just having a couple of minutes and the next uh, at least we'll stop at a logical point. So again, very, very beautiful touching paragraphs today in the sense uh, we see aspects of Jean's personal life and the pain uh, that she's uh, going through at this stage of her life. But more importantly, uh, what shines through is uh, Baba. What shines through is her love for Baba and her, uh, uh, you know, conviction. Overall, lovely uh, set of pages that we read today. Any other comments? Correct. correct. And her, uh, Baba has given her the blessing. She knows that she is being worked upon by Baba. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, the, so, uh, the other as, thing as is long like as you that said. Is there, yeah. Hmm. So you yeah, have yeah, fortitude to too. fight through, fight through, fight through. Correct. And, and like you said uh, uh, earlier in the discussions, uh, Sanjayji, the fact is a lot of us have gone through a lot of what she's describing here, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah. and that's Baba's uh, way, that's Baba's style, and that's uh, the way of his work. So uh, this is a confirmation that uh, we need not be surprised by what we experience, and we need to continue to have the conviction and uh, fortitude to face it. Yeah, correct, correct. So there is one talk that I recall Adap Kaka talking, you know, in one of the recordings I heard that, you know, some people get that experience, they get something and they get involved with Baba, they fall in love because kuch ho jata hai unki life mein, anything beautiful happens. So he was giving, he was saying that Baba gives you, but he just gives you to trap you actually. 
<laughs> when you get into the net, then you then you are put into all the regular rigor, you know. So <laughs> band bajate hain, you know. You are thrashed like uh, you know the like a uh, washerman throws the water uh, the clothes to clean it, you know. Clothes, something like that. That those examples. So so whenever Baba gives you something that and this is like is is fun to trap you actually in Islam. <laughs> So in in, in Mehrabad the lingo starts. there is a yeah in Mehrabad yeah. lingo there is a word for that uh, chocolate yeah. Baba chocolate <laughs> chocolate <laughs> chocolate just like that so chocolate फेंकते हैं उसके बाद हम पढ़ते हैं और उसके बाद उसके बाद हम पे पड़ता है operation operation चालू होता है उसके बाद चालू चालू होता है knife चालू knife लगाना चालू करते हैं Baba Yes, yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. But it's for our good, and uh, we yeah, yeah. face it and uh, embrace it. Okay, so I'll stop recording. Um, if we don't have anything else to discuss on the book, yeah. Yes, okay. I will stop. Uh,